This podcast is different than most because it's really a visual podcast. Not that it isn't interesting just listening to, but the imagery will really add to the granularity and understanding of what this is. And what this is, is we had the opportunity to go and spend the afternoon with Tim Peterson, who curated the Tom Gillian retrospective, as well as to look at his collection, which has been a permanent collection at Western Spirit since they've opened, which is Courage and Crossroads. And they're two separate and very interesting uh, interviews, the one being the lifespan of Tom Gillian and all he's done, which is very impressive. I was really blown away by the exhibit, I must say. And then Courage and Crossroads, which is a uh, it's a compilation of early Native American art as well as Western art, all the way from you know the earliest Catlins all the way through you know Taos founders and Maynard Dixon, and it's really an amazing collection. I've probably seen the collection 50 times, and I still find things that I didn't know about. It's a great place for learning and absorbing the history of the American West. And we're very fortunate to have Tim take the time and go through his collection and his curation. He also did the big Curtis show that was last year, and he has one of the most impressive Curtis collections there is. So I hope you enjoy it. Again, I think you'll find it more interesting if you can really watch this on the YouTube version, but either way, it's great. So, Tim, tell me what we're looking at when you're, I mean, it looks like this is all Disney stuff right. here, right? Yep, so as a part of the retrospective, what we wanted to do was show some of his Disney uh, renderings and, yes. and images. We include a, a video of some of the renderings that we could, did not borrow from yeah, Walt Disney. That's cool. Um, but all of this is kind of his Disney focus. Yes. He was a pioneer there, worked with some of the greats like Mr. Ryman that worked directly with Walt Disney. Yes. Um, so we kind of really wanted to include this. It took a lot of work to get I Disney bet. to work with us, but they did yeah, They don't want to let it go, right? They don't want to let it go. Yeah. And so it, as a process of this, we really felt to it, maybe created an element of allowing people to understand that these illustrators create a new mm. realm yes. in their minds that they can then put on paper. And you think most of this was kind of 1960s time frame? Uh, this would have been 60s. Yeah, 1960s yep. Disney. Period. So then from after Disney, we then kind of move into his fine arts period and what we really focus on is when he moved to Montana. Yes. So we have a whole section on Montana oh, yeah. land and water. Nice. And all his beautiful landscapes. Again, people think of Tom Gillian as a Teak guy that does the teak. Right, right. Well, it's much more than that. Yeah, I mean, look at this landscape. That's yeah. a masterpiece. Yeah. Along with the landscape, he also did a lot of work on Tom's ability to use structure and yet makes things simple yet complex. Yes. I think it's really hard to do. Yes, it is for anyone. And so, one of the things we have here is a whole section on his iconic Western structures. Mm -hmm. You know, these Western grain elevators, right. a mission, a barn, right. you know, things that people kind of drive by in their car, don't think much of. Right. But if you stop and really take a look at it, it's a very unique shape that you don't need a lot of detail to know that's a grain elevator. And it's the West. And it's the right? West. And you also, I think when you look at them, you see a sense of loneliness and isolation in a right. weird way, too. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, here's a painting. Again, a, a Montana painting on the Missouri River in uh, Montana called Over the Rainbows. Yeah. And the one thing you'll find with Tom is, <laughs> look at the titles. He's yeah. got a very creative mind. So like Over the Rainbows represents every color of the rainbow is in that painting. Yes. And yet they're fishing for rainbow trout. Right. And so there's this element of the color contrast and the ability of taking a yellow and reflecting it on yes. the water to turn it more orange is just a that's that takes a lot of skill you know and just that one lone tree that's up there somehow that really brings Bring. the whole you know you just see this line going to the people in the yep. in the boat yeah, yeah that's so, also another masterpiece right just a beautiful <laughs> yeah, painting and gosh. this is the same scene at night oh uh, yeah wow so within this this exhibit i really tried to develop a strategy of having people come in here and realize the depth. the depth of yeah. his work. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's already working for me <clears throat> because, again, I've seen his TP things. I've seen his digital. Yeah. But I had no idea. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's, wow. So, you know, he, he basically moved to Montana. Yes. Uh, 
he, he was influenced quite a bit by Charlie Russell. Mm -hmm. He lives in an area almost exactly where Charlie Russell right. lived. Mm -hmm. They kind of share a barn that right. Charlie housed his horses in. Right. So we kind of wanted to include an area recognizing that relationship yes. with Tom, with Charlie Russell. Yeah. Um, and then right, almost right behind Tom's home is yes. a place called Square Butte, which is yes. Fort Mountain. Yes, which and is so this, right? It's, here it's, and yep, here, right? Yep. So that's a Charlie Russell painting, and Fort yeah. Mountain's in the background. Yes. And then this was a piece Tom did of Fort Mountain. And then this whole section is focused yeah. on Fort Mountain. And do you know when he did this quattro tick? I mean, uh, it, this is a this it looks is newer. The, this is four seasons of Fort Mountain: spring, yes. summer, winter, fall. I'm not sure exactly when this was done. Yes. Um, this is the um, property of Tom Petrie. Yes, I, I mean, when I see this, I would think he did this, which inspired him to do the digital. It's, You're exactly right. That's what I would think. Exactly I mean, I could right. see it going, oh, I'm gonna do this. And then he goes, well, there could be more, there could be movement, right. there could be something else. And that digital aspect of his mind he already kicks works in. with kicks in, yep. wow. And so you kind of realize that that in a weird way is a digital. The, yeah. the four Let's seasons. just walk over there and we can get just a little bit of a shot too so people can see what we're talking yep. about, right? So. so kind of the four seasons of Fort Mountain, you realize right. like, like what I always am intrigued by is when the artist can tell a story yeah. beyond just a painting yes. is it tell a story. And this surely kind of tells yeah. the story. And yeah. like you look at this, you feel cold. That's my cold. favorite one. <laughs> you feel cold. Yeah. And the storms yeah. of winter, right? Yes. And so then he kind of takes that and he says, okay, I can make it even a bigger story right. through Which the use does. of digital. Yes. And the one thing interesting too in this is, you know, that little buffalo skull stays constant throughout the digital. Yeah. So, you know, it really it gives is you a kind point of, of reference. Exactly. Along with Fort Mountain itself. That some things don't change right. really is the geography and then you know, the past. Right. And Square Butte slash Fort Mountain was named by Lewis and Clark. Yeah. So cool. they passed right wow. by this, yeah. Yeah. saw it in the distance and thought it looked like a fort. Yeah. And that's how it got its name. And so, you know me, I love Lewis and Clark. Oh, I know. So, yeah, uh, you're probably one of the foremost <laughs> historians on that field, I would think. So. so. Oh, and I love this because you did this in the Curtis exhibit too. Correct. You put these kind of you know, components on the wall, which I thought just added, you know, so much. I, in fact, I spent a long time taking photos and video of that exhibit okay. because, you know, it gave yeah. me sense, oh, we could do yeah. this or that too. Well, and I think what I kind of wanted, this wall is all dedicated to teepee, and we'll yes. talk about one of them in yes. a minute here, but I, I just like the element of allowing people to get a sense of scale yeah. and get a sense of an abstraction and yet it's a teepee within a teepee. Yeah, plus it's just beautiful, quite yeah. frankly. Yeah. You know, the aesthetically yeah. it's beautiful. So after, we'll get to that at the end. Okay. So after kind of the Fort Mountain material, we kind of focus on his, what I call his fine art period. This was the period when he was really doing a lot of Western material. Right. Um, you know, as you probably know, Tom is quite famous for his nine panels. Yes. And so we included some of the nine panels in this section of the exhibit. Um, everything uh, from wow. this, which is called bulls and bears. Again, kind of a play on words. Everybody yes. thinks of a bull and bear as the stock market. Right. Here he's talking about the <laughs> bulls and bears that have relevance to the Native American yeah. and society and culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then that one over there is called bloodlines, um, which is really kind of, if you look, there's that image of the red going through them, yes. connecting them. Um, and yet one is an older chief, yes. the other one is a younger chief. One almost looks passive like peace. Yes. The other one has a war shield as if it's, you know, expecting war. But, and you look at this though, and you can see like a Rothko-esque background, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's a modernistic right. sensibility. And, and this has got a Andy Warhol, Warhol. Feel. Yeah, I mean, you right. see that. I mean, he did something like this right. with a single thing. So the, everything he does has got an interesting component. Yeah. The other thing, if there are people that ever, if, if they do come to this exhibit. Which they we, should. We, we have added quite a few um, QR codes. Oh, nice. In the exhibit. So if you'll look, we have a QR code for this painting. Right. Which is Dirge of, the, Dirge of the Blackfeet. And I highly recommend taking the time 
to put your phone up to the QR code. Right. Because what you get is not only a little information about the painting, but a video that Tom does. Oh, wow. Talking about the painting. Oh, wow. And so this was inspired by a, 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 a poem written by a female person about the death of a person. Yeah. Tom wanted to do something about the, the potential death of a certain type of society yes. and a culture and right. how it changes and how he doesn't want that. Um, and so this was kind of inspired by that. Yes. So there, there's, a, there's an element of it. They are much more than just a teepee painting. Yes, there's a history, there's a story, story. as you like, right. and we all like. I mean, yep. a great painting has a story. Exactly. And it doesn't matter what it is, but it should bring out emotion. Exactly. And clearly his work does. does. This one's particularly beautiful. Yep. This is, a, like, this is one of his more recognizable yeah. uh, TP paintings called Big Dogs, did yeah. it in 2009. Yeah. Um, and just a beautiful use of color and light mm -hmm. and contrast, and yet you don't see detail, right? But what you see is the TP, and you, you kind of feel that setting. setting. You really do. Yeah. yeah. So from there, uh, we then move on to his period of his career, where, which he calls MMXX. Okay, what is which that? Which is 2020. Oh, uh, got it. So Tom in 2020 kind of had this vision and this belief that I need to, I need to make sure that I, the time I have remaining, every painting counts. counts. Yeah. And so he also, I would say, he paints bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, and they tend to be much more emotional impact mm. by them. Um, so these are three of them. And so he started this in 2020? He started, most of the, everything you see in here has kind of been from 2020 So you on. have COVID on top of that, yes. which also brings together the sense of things can change, things can end. I want whatever I have time left to count. To count, exactly. Yeah, and that's so shows. this is a large painting wow. called Evolving Evolutions. Wow. And beautiful. what you see in that very different from a typical Western painting, yes. correct? Yeah, very much And so. you see images within images. Yeah. Um, and it is evolving. So as you look at it, it evolves. Yes. And as you look at it, you see a new image all the time. Yes, it does. It's very interesting. Which again gets into, it's almost like a, it's a, it's a flat piece of art, but yet it has- Three dimensionality. Three dimensionality, yeah. movement, Yes. Um, and, and, a, and an abstractness that in today's society, that's what a lot of people are interested in. Yeah, and I think you have to really look at this painting. I mean, I'm still looking at it for the first time and I see things coming in and out of the picture, whether it's an exactly. eagle or different types of faces. Yep. And that had to be interesting to yeah. paint. Yeah, actually. this took him a long time. I bet. And then, and then we kind of get into the digital painting. Yeah, look at that. And here again, this digital painting is with the help of uh, Tom literally paints on a pad. Yes. And if you watch it, it literally evolves. And so even something like this, you see those highlights. Yes. So these are truly his paintings, multiple paintings that are then digitally rendered right. that come across as like a movie. Yes. And, and he, so, he has a company even for this that right. is for digital production. Correct. He, he and Marshall have this company, I believe it's called Pixoils. That's right, yeah. Um, and Tom, so as you watch that, yes. look how yeah, this the element changed. just flows into wow. the next element. Oh yeah, look at that. And he's um, 80 years old and he's doing this. Right. Which is really which, impressive. Which again is why I'm just so <laughs> intrigued by this guy and I look at this and I say, yeah. here's a guy that's 82 years old and he's cutting edge. Yeah, he's creative. he's creative. He's a very creative individual. Right. Yeah. So the, the digital to me is a, a very... And curious too. Curious. He's a very curious yeah. guy. So uh, some additional paintings. Yes. This one on the right is quite u unique. You know, it's this element of behind you, you would think it's, it's the sun, but it's actually a war shield up there. Uh, yeah. The wings of an eagle. Yes. Um, it's got a peace pipe, and if you look, yes. your initial reaction is he's on standing. But if you look and take a different perspective of it, uh -huh. he's actually floating up in the air, and you can see the shadow of, of his feet on uh, the bottom. Yeah. What's the title? Do we know? Yeah. Well, this, one, this is uh, Wings of Man. Wings of Man. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, very cool. So, yeah, this is a. Uh, and, and you know, it had to be hard 
to get all these pieces, right? I mean, out of private collections. I mean, we're talking right. major works. Right. Yeah. We, we borrowed from about 25 different uh, collectors. Yes. Um, it was a big project. Um, but I think it also tells you how much the collectors that do have Tom's work want to share want to share it yeah. and love it enough to say yeah I'm willing to give it up for three or six or twelve months yeah I mean is, like a painting like that behind us which is huge you take that out of somebody's home it's it's a loss it's a loss <laughs> right. I mean and there's right. Curtis I see and that there, he you know a lot of the photographs that you see of Tom's have kind of been inspired by some Curtis photographs right. or other, uh, uh, Frank Reinhardt photographs mm -hmm. and others, um, and he he loved Edward Cur loves Edward Curtis, so this was an Edward Curtis nine panel, mm. and it's based off of if you look on the left, those are the actual those are actual Edward Curtis. Yes, uh, I have a photo photo gravure, a silver piece, and then a platinum. So three different versions of yes. Curtis's, and those are the three images in the middle. And for so, those people who don't know. He is one of the foremost experts and collectors on Curtis. You did a huge show, the biggest Curtis show ever, actually, at this museum just a year ago. Yep. So he knows what he talks about. Well, I hope so. I, <laughs> I hope know so. you do. <laughs> and then in the, the exhibit can kind of concludes with our tribute to the teepee, because that's what everybody thinks about. And so we kind of call it the, the TP has really been good to me. That's a really interesting thing. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah. that has, a, again, a very interesting meaning. Yes. Tom Gillian went to the University of Florida. The title of the piece is Tebow Teepee. <laughs> so everyone probably thinks it's kind of like a tribute to Tim Tebow and f have his Florida Wayne relationship. Tebow. I think it's Wayne Tebow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it's actually a tribute to Wayne Tebow, Wayne Tebow. Yeah. And he is known for his paintings of kind of food and desserts right. and everything. Right. But pop he art. tends to have lots of pop art slash shadows in yes, his paintings. I and do. so this was Tom's tribute to, to Wayne Tebow. Wow, that's cool. Um, and do you know on the logo, how, how did that happen? It's a beautiful logo. Uh, Tom, Tom created that. I believe it was with help probably from... Uh, Richard King, his uh, kind of publicist yes, right. um, person, uh, his representative, as well as Marshall Monroe. That's very cool. Isn't it? The, it is his really logo cool. is fantastic. I know, it's like a world-class yeah, logo. Exactly. And so these are, again, what most people, I think, in, have in the past, at least, have thought about her as TP painting. Correct. But if you come to the show and you don't walk away going, oh, it's way more than that. Right. Then you've missed the meaning of what right. this show is. There, there's been a lot of people that have kind of jumped on the teepee bandwagon right. and now do teepees. Yes. I think it's very hard to top his approach to the teepee as yes. not the teepee, but form, structure, light, yeah. and just the fact yeah, especially that there's, the light. there's a story behind it. Yes. And what we kind of want to do is kind of connect these. You know, this one, for example, is called Moon Shadows. Yes. And this is in the evening with the fire. But then this one is actually called Moon Goes Down. So you yeah. actually see the moon on this yeah. one. And if you think about it, that moon carries over and creates the oh, shadow yeah. over nice. there. Nice. Nice. And did, was that a known thing when, you, when he did this? Or you saw this when you were I, setting it up as a curator? I, I basically got a, ba a big package of all his, not all, but a yeah. lot of his paintings. And then I kind of created the, the, the story in the puzzle. Yeah. Um, and kind of looked at that and said, yes. let's link those together. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, in the Curtis show you did, it was clear the thought pattern, how you right. put it all as one. Well, thank you. So, uh -huh. so yeah, it's, um, it, it's been a... Um, Richard King, as I mentioned, was a co-curator, did a lot of the work as well, yes. um, and had full support from Tom. Yeah. And I hope it's. Uh, I hope how, it's. Do we know uh, how long it's going to be up for? It'll be here, I believe, through August, and then in August it'll be going to the C.M. Russell Museum. Okay, and so it'll we're at Western Spirit right now in Scottsdale, and then it goes up to the Russell. Yep. Very good. Well, thank you. You're welcome. I'll do this. Boom. Thank you so much You're for. Welcome, uh, Mark. You know, taking the time. I know you're very busy. No and, problem. And thank you for uh, showing the interest. Oh, yeah. No, this is fantastic. That's yeah. great. I can hardly wait to talk to him and just say, yeah, oh, my God. What yeah. a great <laughs> what a great exhibit. All right. Tom Gillian and Tim Peterson. Thank you. Thank you. All right.
So Tim Peterson has been kind enough to give us a personal tour, that doesn't happen often because he doesn't live here, of his collection for the Courage and Crossroads, which is a major important exhibit at the Western Spirit. I say that because it has not only some of the early material of painters, things that you can't see, but also Native American material. It's exhaustively beautiful, early, rare things like a first phase chief's blanket and pony beaded things as well. So I'll lead it to you. I'm just going right. to watch and you can tell me about what we're All looking right. at. So one of the, when we start talking about early Western expansion, Western ex exploration, you know, it really kind of starts with Lewis and Clark. But, but when you start talking about the art component to it, most people think two of the early pioneers were Carl Bodmer right. and Catlin. Catlin. Um, George Catlin. And so I have really in this early on, mm. you walk in and you see material from Bodmer and Catlin mm. both. Yeah. And these are all kind of lithos and etchings from their periods of the books and the work they did while they were exploring the Native American culture in the you know, 1820s 30. to 1830s yeah, really. Exactly. Um, so rare objects that give you a sense of really kind of pre-contact with correct. the American culture. And, and everything culture. we do in here, we're trying to give some perspective on a, on a context of not just the material, but the landscape that goes with it. So yes. for example, we, we try to show a map oh, yeah. to give you a sense of kind of the travels of Bodmer. Wow, and that's um, like an 18, 20, 30 kind of thing? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I think it's important, I mean, to right. tell the story, the whole story. Right. Uh, and sometimes it's, you know, good, and sometimes it's like, oh, that right. wasn't great either. So, so here's kind of, again, we start off with Lewis and Clark as kind yes. of the starting point of the exhibit. Um, I'd point out this. This is the original presentation tomahawk that Meriwether Lewis owned. <laughs> he had this on his possession upon his death. Uh, when he died, the president uh, sent a courier over and to document everything that was in his possession. And this was documented in the, the public records. Um, that's a early edition of the Lewis and Clark journals. Yes. Um, the tomahawk was owned by his family until uh, recently when I bought it yes. years, years ago. And now instead of just being in a family, it's actually <clears throat> in a museum where people can come look at it and hear the story. Correct. Yeah. This is one of the rarest, rarest objects. objects you can find. Probably the rarest. It, it is a presentation piece pipe, yes. yes. So that you could actually smoke it. You, you yep. could. Yeah, it's, it's very detailed, it's very ornate, it's in unbelievable condition, which probably gives you the impression it was probably never used as a Yeah, it, was a, a present, it was a presentation piece. Yep. So moving over to just... So just, now we kind of get into that early phase of art. Um, right. This is an extremely rare uh, um, Plains Indian outfit. Um, probably around 1820. Yes. Uh, it's got the pictograph images on it. What's interesting about this is this was actually found in a in a trunk in Scotland. And you yes. might ask why why in Europe? And when you when you read about American history, those early explorers, those early travelers and traders were typically hired by European companies. Mm -hmm. And they would actually bring back some of the greatest sure. material to Europe. And so to this day, if you go to some of the museums in Germany and in Europe, you'll find unbelievable right. Right. Not only Native the, American yeah, material. Including Hawaiiana material too. Exactly. From the Cook expedition. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's it was a real find. It's a, a really special piece. You'll notice it's got the long leg tabbings, which yes. is an indication of being a very early uh, yes, piece. No, it's, and it's in just excellent condition, yeah. which is amazing. And so then what I really kind of wanted to do is, here again after Lewis and Clark, is who were the early artists that really kind of pioneered this exploration process? And most people associate it with Bodmer, Catlin, Alfred Jacob Miller, right. and Peter Rindischbacher. Yes. And so I have an image, uh, a painting or a watercolor from each one of them. Wow. Um, Which are very hard to come by. Very hard. I to mean, come that's by. a cat. That's an original cat. Original right? cat. So, and that alone is <laughs> yeah. museum yeah. worthy. Uh, female buffalo robe. Um, again, what they call a box and border. Yes. All of those have a symbol that they actually represent the internal organs of 
of buffalo. Yes. Um, and so, you know, we have a couple of buffalo robes here in the exhibit. I thought it was important to have both a female and a male buffalo robe. Yeah, and I like the fact that we're, you're telling the story and it's mainly about, you know, painters that are doing a lot of the Western material, but at the same time, you're not leaving out the fact that Native Americans were the original people making art and including them and showing their story as well, which I think is a wonderful exactly. aspect. Exactly, and, and if, if there's almost only one message I can send when I try to do this, these exhibits, it's, it's the beauty and artistry of not just the artist, but the creator of that material. And mm -hmm. so what you'll see is these, in these early Native American materials is the artistry and the techniques you know, like these have cross, in, in what they call cross sizing, where if you look close, yes. somebody took a, a, like a hand tool and cross, almost why I call almost cross stitched yes. and cross haired all those. Um, and so it's so modern too. Yeah. I mean, you see this, you think Donald Judd, you know, and his yep. sculptures are. So you know. very, very artistic, beautifully creative people. Yes. Um, there's another Catlin, and what's unique is, oh, yeah, as I, you probably know uh -huh. with me, Mark, is I love uh -huh. process. Yes. So this was an original pencil drawing yes. that he ended up doing yeah. into that. That's so, amazing they got together. Yeah, and that's what I, that's what I love about yeah. doing this, is the hunt <laughs> yes. of finding things that go together. And putting them back to history, right? right? Correct. So it's not, they've, they've been lost and now they're back together. Yep. Uh, this is a great early, early, uh, what they call a male buffalo robe. It tells a story. It's, mm. a, it's in essence almost like pictographs, but on, on a buffalo robe. Mm. Um, and we know a little bit about the story of this. The main characters are, are these two people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, an extremely rare piece. Yes. Um, yeah, because this has got to be what, 1870s, 60s? Oh, this is earlier than that. that. This would probably be 1820 to 1840. Oh, yes. So that's really rare. Yep. That's really rare. Yeah, it's amazing it survived. Yep. And then throughout the exhibit, we have other displays of the artistry of the Native American mm -hmm. people. Most, most of my collection, I have focused on pre-reservation period material. Mm -hmm. So most of the objects that you'll look at are going to be prior to 1875 or 1880 mm. when the yes. reservations were forced on the Native Americans. Yes, yes. Um, and so there's just a handful. The, um, the bow and arrow, if you look closely at that quiver, it's got quill work on it that's absolutely just beautiful, beautiful yeah. artistry. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And then from there, we continue on, and we really, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big Alfred Jacob Miller fan, mm -hmm. as you can tell. I have both some of, he was really the first person that went to the rendezvous. Right, to the Bill Sublet. Bill Sublet. Yeah. And so I have some of the early drawing slash pen and ink mm. pieces that he did dirt while he was at the rendezvous. Wow. And then as well as some of the paintings and, and watercolor. Yeah, and you have a did. major, major painting there. Yeah. I mean, because you think of, at least I think of them usually as being fairly small. Right. But that's not small and it's yeah. original oil. Yeah, those are beautiful. And then you have the pony beaded objects Correct. that would have been in that kind of same time frame. The things he would have experienced when you see his drawings, you, these are the kind of objects that they, you know, what they would have worn. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <coughs> and then I'm, you know, we'll probably talk about it more later, but you know, my, my initial interest in all of this history kind of really became an element of two elements. One, uh, Lewis and Clark, mm -hmm. reading Undaunted Courage by, uh, um, by the great author Ambrose. Yeah. Um, and then when I was a little kid watching the movie Jeremiah Johnson. Yeah. And I kind of fell in love with right. the mountain man. Yeah. And yeah. I grew up in Minnesota, so I did a lot of outdoor hunting and fishing and right. outdoor activities. Um, so it was seen kind of natural. Yeah, you can relate to yeah. that process. So we then kind of move into the, the, the fur trapper period. Yes. And we have an early coat oh, as cool. well as a hawk and rifle. And then we kind of move on to some. A, a, a broad example of some yeah. period, mountain man period pieces. Alfred Another Jacob couple Miller. of Alfred Jacob Millers with a study that goes with the wow. piece. <laughs> That's amazing you were able to find that. A William Ranney pencil drawing. Yes. Another Alfred Jacob Miller. And then we kind of go to this piece here by Curtis Delano. 
Yes. And the reason we kind of conclude that, what I call the mountain man period with this, is you can now see that he's basically using a covered wagon. Mm. So it's not just the traditional rendezvous of a horse in right. a pack. Now he's using a, like a covered wagon. And in the back, it doesn't look necessarily like, like beaver pelts, but more like buffalo hides. Yes, so um, pre-1878. Yep. And then even if you look, even though we're not looking at it, it's just so amazing that it's right across the way you have this monumental grouping of Thomas Moran pieces of yep. Yellowstone, yep. Green River, Correct. you know, photographs, yeah. Yep. And, you know, to me, the West is, is more than just the people, it's the landscape. Yes. And that's what, you know, a beautiful sky in New Mexico where you're at right. or in Montana is hard to forget. Yes. So these are pieces that we've uh, collected over the years. And you'll notice the small pen and ink and etchings are yes. related to the oil paintings or the oh, watercolors yeah. above it. And, you know, if you don't have a Thomas Moran going to Yellowstone, we don't get the National Park done because that's what really was the emphasis was what he had done painting wise. Even though he's, you know, he's from, you know, England and comes over here, right. he really changes the way we as Americans see that importance of the West. Yep. And, and what's interesting, as you know, is that these handful of artists and, and people like you know, George Bird Grinnell. Yes they had such an influence on the, the, the conservation process and the development of the parks right. and the people that they knew. Like, you know, these, these people knew Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. And so that helped influence foster them. Yeah. and influence them. Yes. Um, and so this is moving back to the, still doing the rendezvous mountain men early time frame still here? Well, once we get to kind of past the, the curd, the uh, Delano, I'm now starting to talk about the actual struggle and engagement of the frontier. So yes. when the manifest when, destiny kind of time frame, post exactly. 1848 type thing. Yep. Yep. And so this is when you're starting getting the fur trappers that no longer are fur trapping are now becoming guides and scouts for wagon trains. Yes. And the conflict between the settlers and the cavalry is starting to pick up. Yes in the 18, you know, 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. um, which eventually leads to, you know, Little Bighorn. Yes. But this is all kind of that time period of what they depict. And it's, a, you know, it's an a, a interesting because it's a variety of artists from W.R. Lee to Struggle Vogel to Wig Horse. So some of these are a little later painters, most early, still early Western, but they're telling the story. They're telling the story, yeah. correct. And then these paintings, um, again, <laughs> I think to kind of highlight a couple of historical things that people think about when they think about the West. One is the stagecoach. Right. That's a large oil painting by Herman Hansen. Correct. Um, and the one on the right is called the Pony Express, also by Herman Hansen. And then the one on the left is like an example of a frontiersman slash cowboy, I should say, you know, having a conflict with the Native Americans. Right. So all of them have this element of an iconic component, Pony Express, Stagecoach, Cowboy, yes. and how we had periods where they got along and periods that there was And I think conflict. also an interesting underlying story is you got a guy like Hansen, right? He's German, he comes yeah. over at the turn of the century, and he is completely enthralled with what is America, what is the West, Correct. and he donates his life till he dies in 1924 of doing these kind of imagery. And I'm sure he talked to lots of people. He was friends with Dixon. You know, he had all these interesting components to right. be able to, to, again, show the West because he's inspired. The West inspires. Right. It inspires in the East, Japan, everywhere. Right. It really is an inspiration, even today. And I think sometimes people forget about that. Yeah. And, and, and this helps show it too. And that's the goal. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is what you hit on is how interrelated so many of these people are. Yes. That, you, know, Ma you know, Maynard Dixon, who you love, I love. Yes. Like he knew lots of these people. Yeah. So there's this element of communication and flow and I sharing ideas. They were friends. Yeah. And his son, Armin Hansen, looked to Dixon as a mentor. Oh, is, I didn't know that. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. So famous, you know, like landscape and yes, and, and uh, you know, so yeah. Armin Hansen starts to do the Salinas rail, the rodeos, yeah. and that's again inspired from watching Dixon and talking to Dixon. Oh, okay. Hansen, Armin Hansen talks about how 
you know, Dixon truly was a mentor, almost a father figure, you know, because his dad dies in 24, 24. and Dixon's still around right. for another 20, you know, plus years. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. So it's, a, you know, right. it's all there. And then yeah. so now you have some ledger drawings. ledger drawings. So we kind of view it as at the end of that settlement, at the end of the settlement and conflict yes. period, we, um, you know, that's when the reservation period kicks in really. Mm -hmm. And so what we try to show here is the representation that has become much more acknowledged is the Native Americans did a lot of, while on reservations, did a lot of ledger drawings. Yes. These ledger drawings typically were to remember their history and you know, be able to put it in writing right. or in a, in a graphic format, their history yes. of their exploits or their battles or their friendships. Um, and these are just three examples of, um, of some of the ledger drawings. And again, with a map, a, you know, yep. a vintage map showing kind of what the reservations, what's happening at yep. that time. Yep, and where they were located yes, in the United States. Yes, that's a beautiful States. map, too. That's, and that's and then gorgeous. This is a very rare thing, which is actually a double-sided ledger drawing. It, yes. So the ledger drawing, both sides of the paper were, were done and done beautifully. And so we included that and kind of created a nice display case so you get to see both sides. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. That's just the exhibit of that, you know, because it's easy. I have pieces like that in my own collection, and I unfortunately have never done that. Yeah. But maybe I will. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll steal that idea. So when we kind of go through that reservation period, um, I then wanted to kind of step back and highlight a couple of artists that everybody, almost everybody knows, which is Remington and Russell. Right. And what I then thought is, well, I want people to know more than just Remington and Russell, because mm. everybody thinks of them as just a painter. Mm -hmm. But they did much more than just paint with oils. They did watercolors, they did gouache, they did pen and ink, mm -hmm. they did pencil. Bronzes. Um, and bronzes. Yeah. And so in this section dedicated to Lou, uh, uh, Russell and Remington, I try to show each one of those different mediums. Yes. So we have a bronze of Russell, a watercolor, a beautiful, beautiful oil painting, pen and ink, and a colored watercolor mixed medium piece. Yes. And then we do the same approach with the Remington material. Yes. We have a fantastic early bronze here called the Mountain Man. Yes. And then we have oil paintings, mm -hmm. watercolors, mixed medium, and so forth. It's really an amazing collection. You know, I've seen this many times, but it still blows my mind when I come in. And of course, it's, you know, for me, this is a gift because I get to hear the person and put it together. Thanks. But it still kind of just blows my mind the number of <laughs> pieces that are in this one floor. Many museums would love to have a section of that. Oh, thank just you. a little thank section. You. So, so we, we then wanted to highlight some other components of, of Native American history and Western history yes. that people oftentimes hear about, but they're not really sure what it is. And one of the things that a lot of people hear about is Native American chief blankets. Right. So I spent many years working with just a very handful few people, and we accumulated and got a extremely rare first phase, yes. second phase, and third phase chief's blankets. And um, you, know, you, you know all about the different phases. Yes. You can explain it as well or better than I can. Yes. But what I guess what I would stress is what we really wanted to do was make it where you had an appreciation of the artistry of this material, the rareness of this quality Correct. of material. Because as an individual, each one of these is world class, I, I believe. That's true, it is. But when you put them all together, it's pretty special. And so we kind of created this, if you yes. notice, we kind of created a, a U to this. Because what I wanted to do was have an element where when you got in the middle of it, mm. you almost felt like the, the, the blankets mm. were surrounding mm. you, like you were almost wearing them. Yes. And so the, the process of, of these has been an element of not just the objects, but the design and the element of does it, how do you make it mm -hmm. user friendly and creative to maybe hopefully send, spell, spell out a message and a communication that people enjoy. And there's another thing about this that is interesting is you're looking at technology. So when you look and you stand here, 
you have the technology of change from yeah. a first phase, simple stripes, and then over a period of time, and just doesn't happen overnight, but right. like technology, then you have the 12 bars of the second phase. And then you have one of the earliest, you'll see the third phase. This is probably one of the earliest examples you're ever gonna see of that because the diamonds aren't big, they're small. So you literally see you know, what happens in a 50 year period and you're standing right in it. Right, That's exactly. That's very unusual. And how colors change because yes. of technology, of That's, the use of dyes right. and everything else. We unraveled the edo. We see the world may be a little different than exactly. how you want it. You exactly. Know? So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting show. Be beautiful artistry. Yeah, and you don't need more than three, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah, they, they tell us You've got the best three. Right. So, so well, then from, from there, when we're talking about the Southwest, you, you can't talk about the Southwest without talking about the Taos right. area. Yeah. And so the, the Taos Society was this group, as you know, of great artists that came out, were totally fascinated by the beauty of the area you live in, right. and Taos and Santa Fe. And so what we tried to do here is show a representation of almost every major Taos painter. Yes. In, that, of the Taos Society. And good examples too. Yes. Good to, great. Yeah. I mean, you got a Bloom and Shine, and, you know, you've got, is that Roll Chauvin? Roll yes. Chauvin. Yeah, you've got Catherine, Catherine Critcher. Critcher Catherine the, Critcher, only female um, artist. Yes. Extremely rare to find her pieces. Yes. Um, but yeah, so we tried Laverne to- Vern Black, Nelson, yeah. you know, you have, yeah, you have in a, this area, some of the most iconic kind of imagery you would want to think of yeah. when you think about the, the Taos. Taos. Yeah. And, and, you know, the museum here did that beautiful, big Taos exhibit. Yes. Um, and I just felt it was so powerful. We kind of wanted a, a, a very shrunk down version right. so people <laughs> still had an appreciation of that, that period. Oh, look at that little Dunton. Yeah. yeah, they're just so beautiful. And then finally, we kind of close out by after the Taos Society saying, who, uh, who else, you know, kind of prior to 1960, um, 1950 had a major influence on the Western art world, right? And it's Maynard Dixon. Yeah. And so this wall is kind of my dedication to Maynard nice. Dixon. Uh -huh. um, as you can see, one of your, one of the paintings that's actually the cover of your book yes. is uh, in in the exhibit here. Um, and so we try to kind of close it out by recognizing the, what I view as the, the early stage contemporary artist of Maynard Dixon, who I think um, is just a genius. Yeah, yeah. No, I love the fact that you finished it out with Dixon. You know, he is in that transition too, right? He's born in 1875. He knows the individuals, that new Custer. He knows Buffalo Bill. He knows all these, you know, he knows what the Old West really is. Yeah. But he's going from that time frame of early all the way into the nuclear age. So he's, cr he's crossing it. He's the divide to the next stage. And well, it and, and, makes perfect sense that right, you would end here. Right, and you know, one of the stories you told me that I, I never can get out of my mind when I talk about Dixon mm -hmm. is the fact that here's a, here's a gentleman that painted the West like this mm -hmm. and yet created the color of the Golden Gate That's Bridge. Right. Yeah. And so you're talking about industrial <laughs> change. Yeah. And he's painting Native American and early, beautiful, right. early Western landscape, but recognizes the importance of the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. Rather than just being a structure, it's, a, it's, a, it's an iconic image yeah. of the West. Yeah, and he's involved in doing all the drawings that gets the $35 million you know, budget passed to get it done. And right. it, then he goes and does Boulder Dam and is there for a month documenting the next biggest component of the, you know, that was ever done in the 20th right. century. Yeah, I remember when you first told me that, I was just like, I, I just think it's so amazing. <laughs> so anyway, that, yes. that's kind of how we conclude. Well, we the appreciate exhibit. you using Dixon at the end. No problem. And we appreciate what you've done for, you know, Western art, Native American art, and uh, this museum. It's a, it's a really an honor to have gotten to go walk around with you. No problem. Yeah. Thanks. You bet. Appreciate you. all we'll, your work. I will do. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, come to Western Spirit and come upstairs and you can see one of the great exhibits you're ever going to see on Western and Native art. Thank you.